Now, I was somebody who tended to believe that there was a cosmological constant in nature and that the universe was expanding or accelerated expansion. And if it is accelerated expansion, the universe is described by something that's called the sitter space. The sitter space is a very interesting thing. It's almost like an inside out black hole. We are in the inside and out at a certain distance away, 15, 20 billion light years away, there's a horizon and things fall out. They don't fall into the black hole. They fall out from our universe out through that horizon. It's like an inside out black hole, but don't get the idea that it means that we're inside a black hole. It doesn't. The Sitter universe is a desolate, barren, cold, infinite void and it is characterized by its high degree of symmetry, and is homogeneous and isotropic, meaning that it looks the same in all directions and at all locations in space, and it is also a maximally symmetric space. Its geometry is completely determined by its curvature. Desitter space is an open-like universe that expands forever. It is what our universe is believed to be in the far future. An indication of the distance from which information might be retrieved is called a cosmological horizon, the expanding universe and different aspects of general relativity, and the physics of Big Bang cosmology all contribute to this observable restriction. The observable universe's size and scale are determined by cosmological horizons, but despite the possibility that the universe is infinitely large, and according to the widely accepted theory, we can only observe a small portion of it. There are a few commonly accepted definitions of cosmic horizons, which are distance restrictions imposed by cosmology. As always, I will keep the mathematics at a minimum. The goal is to attempt a non-technical explanation. But first let us start by defining the particle horizon, which is a boundary of the observable universe. When we observe a far-off galaxy, its light will have traveled to us over a period of millions or even billions of years. The proper distance to a faraway object or a galaxy, for example, would be measured if a ruler of cosmological scale could be built between that galaxy and the Earth. This is the distance at a particular moment between that galaxy and us. The separation between two distant objects that are not bound together by gravity grows over time since the universe is expanding. Theoretical maximum distance that we can now observe is known as the particle horizon and it surrounds the Earth in a spherical shell with a radius of 46.5 billion light years. So, the light from any object at the particle horizon will have been emitted at the beginning of the universe and will have been traveling towards us for the whole history of the universe. When we look at distant objects, we are looking back in time, so the particle horizon which serves as the limit of the observable universe, contains everything that we can currently see. The universe is not old enough for an object's light to have traveled to us if it is located beyond the particle horizon. This particle horizon would have been zero at the moment of the Big Bang, and as the universe ages, it grows. We know this because light can travel a longer distance before it reaches us as the age of the universe gets older. The particle horizon is not actually visible to us. It included a plasma of negatively charged electrons and positively charged hydrogen and helium ions, but plasma is not conductive to electromagnetic radiation, such as light. The cosmic microwave background, or CMB, which was emitted when the universe was just 400,000 years old, and at which point it had cooled sufficiently for individual atoms to form, is the oldest radiation that humans are able to detect. Since then, the CMB radiation we see today has been moving in our direction and was produced by a spherical shell of points that are located roughly 46 billion light years away from Earth. The recessional velocity given by formula V equals H multiplied by D, where V is the velocity of an object that is moving away from us and D is the distance to that object. The Hubble constant is roughly 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec if V is expressed in kilometers per second and D in megaparsecs. 
and calculates the rate of cosmic expansion and is actually more appropriately referred to as the Hubble parameter. At a distance from us of more than 4,300 megaparsecs or 14 billion light years, a galaxy will be receding at a velocity more than 300,000 kilometers per second, which is equal to the speed of light, assuming that Hubble's law is applicable at all distances. Any light it released today would not be able to reach us in that circumstance. The Hubble sphere is a hypothetical sphere with a radius of 4,300 megaparsecs that is centered on the Earth. We would only be able to observe objects that emit light today that are situated inside the Hubble sphere if the Hubble parameter didn't vary over time. However, because the Hubble parameter is dynamic, we also need to take the event horizon into account. The light created right now will travel from this distance to us in the long future at its greatest proper distance. The light of an object will reach us if it is closer than the event horizon. In fact, when faster than light motion occurs outside of the observer's inertial frame, there is no contradiction with special relativity. Distant galaxies are moving superluminally away from us, and this implies that the light they currently generate cannot be seen by us even if they are at rest locally. Special relativity offers a good description of motion in their respective local inertial frames. The Hubble sphere's radius would be the event horizon if the Hubble parameter didn't change throughout time. But since the Hubble constant's value decreases over time in the majority of cosmological models, despite the fact that the universe is expanding, this has the result that the event horizon is greater than the Hubble sphere's radius and that the size of the gap between the two evolves over time. Now let's speak about horizons, since I have mentioned this notion earlier. There are horizons all around us. For example, there is an optical horizon which is located at the surface of last scattering. However, this is not strictly a horizon in the sense of making observations impossible due to relativity or cosmic solutions. This is the maximum distance across which each photon can stream freely. Similar to gravitational waves, there is a gravitational wave horizon established for the most distance at which gravitational waves can freely stream, as well as the neutrino horizon, for the greatest distance at which neutrinos can freely travel. The latter is anticipated to provide as a direct test of when cosmic inflation will terminate. When time goes to infinity in an expanding universe, some events will no longer be observable, as signals from earlier events are redshifted to arbitrarily long wavelengths in a universe that is growing exponentially. A universe that grows forever and the matter inside it is so diluted across all space is called the sitter space. This establishes a limit on how far out we can see while using the units of proper distance that exist today. More precisely, we can observe events that happened at the same location in space in the distant past, but they are spatially separated from the event happening right now for a certain frame of reference. So we will never receive a signal for those events. Even if we wait an endless length of time, we will continue to receive signals from this position in space, but a signal that was sent from that location today will never reach us. The energy and frequency of any signals emanating from that point will gradually decrease until the point effectively ceases to be discernible. If we wait long enough, then everything in the universe will become unobservable since the universe will be dominated by dark energy and will be expanding exponentially in scale factor. In mathematical physics, n-dimensional de-sitter space is a maximally symmetric Lorentzian manifold with constant positive scalar curvature. This is the Lorentzian analog of an n-sphere with canonical Riemannian metric. What the heck all of these means after all? Well, this is the reason that I keep the math at minimum, but important is to keep in mind that in de-sitter space, the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate due to dark energy, and it serves as a useful model for understanding the behavior of the universe. This has implications for topics such as cosmic inflation, the ultimate fate of the universe, and the nature of space and time. This acceleration leads to a distinct geometry characterized by constant positive curvature, similar to the surface of a hypersphere. Our universe is expanding but still contain matter and radiation. On the other hand, de Sitter space is empty except for the dark energy that permeates it, and if one excludes gravity then a consistent Lorentz invariant 
and gauge invariant quantum field theory can only exist in a flat Minkowski spacetime. This spacetime can either be classical or quantum. In other words, a QFT of massless particles can only be defined in a flat Minkowski spacetime. If one adds a cosmological constant to this spacetime, it gets deformed. Depending on the sign of cosmological constant, the curvature of the deformed space is either positive or negative. As it turns out in our universe, the sign of cosmological constant is positive. D sitter space and anti D sitter space are two different types of solutions to the equations of general relativity, which describe the curvature of spacetime in the absence of matter. D sitter space is a model of spacetime that has a positive cosmological constant, representing a universe with a constant positive curvature. This type of universe is often used in cosmology to model an accelerating universe, and is believed that we are already living in a de-sitter universe since all the matter represents only 4% of the universe. In this universe, the observer lives on the inside, and he is surrounded by a cosmological horizon. On the other hand, anti-de-sitter space has a negative cosmological constant, like the interior of a black hole. In this situation, the observer is located outside the anti de Sitter space. This type of spacetime is important in the study of theoretical physics and conformal field theories defined on the boundary of that space. In simpler terms, de Sitter space represents a universe with positive curvature, while anti de Sitter space represents a universe with negative curvature. These concepts are fundamental in understanding the possible shapes and geometries of the universe according to general relativity. The observation that the universe is asymptotically de -sitter at late times could be a sign that Minkowski is not a solution to whatever is the underlying theory of gravity. One possibility here is that curvature tensors are good observable quantum operators in some underlying theory of quantum gravity. This would mean Minkowski is not a vacuum of the theory, and if the Einstein-Hilbert action is recovered in some appropriate limit from some quantum theory of gravity, then it must depend on the scalar curvature operator. If so, and if the theory does not admit Minkowski, the vacuum of the theory could very well be de Sitter in nature. De Sitter space has played a significant role in theoretical physics, particularly in the study of cosmology and the early universe. It serves as a useful model for understanding the behavior of the universe under the influence of dark energy and has implications for topics such as cosmic inflation, the ultimate fate of the universe, and the nature of space and time. <laughs>